Uh, good afternoon. Um, just before we begin, I just want to um, say a few words about the incident that happened in uh, Pittsburgh um, just the other day where 11 people were murdered in a house of worship. And this is a reminder of how we need to always thank um, the members who protect our freedom each and every day uh, here in the United States of America and for all those veterans uh, who uh, spent their years uh, protecting us in in this great country in this great country so I'd just like to ask everyone just to please stand up and let's take a moment of silence Good afternoon, my name is uh, Chaim Daich and I am the chair of the Veterans Committee. I would like to thank you all for being here today and I would like to extend my warmest greetings uh, to the veterans and veteran advocates who uh, uh, joined us today. Uh, this hearing will focus on veterans' access to services that the city provides across the five boroughs as well as the findings of the annual Veterans Services Report compiled by the Mayor's Office of Operation we will also hear testimony in intro 1118 legislation which seeks to gather more information about how the Department of Veterans Services is operating and uh, being used. Intro uh, 1118, which I am proud to sponsor, would require DVS to submit an annual report to the council, including indicators on personal and per personnel and performance. Specifically, DVS would be required to report on the number of employees serving in each title within the agency, as well as the services provided by each of these titled employees. The agency will also report the number of veterans who receive services from DVS, as well as how veterans and their families learned about the services provided by the agency. This bill is the starting point for a conversation about what information DVS can provide that would help the city assess how it is serving our veterans. We hope to hear from the administration and advocates how to improve it and to be more comprehensive and, and useful as it can be. Uh, the 2017 Veterans Service Report will be another issue that, will, uh, that we examine today. Uh, the report, which was prepared by the Mayor's Office of Operation, compiled information from a number of city agencies that offer veteran-specific opportunities in the areas of employment and housing. These agencies include DCA, DCAS, DOH, MH, HPD, and NYCHA. It is uh, vital that veterans can access city benefits from Michelama housing to HUD bash vouchers and civil service examination fee waivers in a convenient, timely, and efficient manner. I am excited to discuss the findings of the report with the administration to ensure that the former service members have all of the support and information they need as they readjust to civilian life. I would like to thank committee staff counsel, Nuzat uh, Chadhuri, uh, policy analyst uh, Michael Katz, and uh, fi uh, finance analyst uh, Zachary Harris for their work. Finally, I would like to recognize the committee members that have joined us here. Uh, I'd like to recognize council member uh, Paul Vallone. Uh, thank you, commissioner. and. Uh, if we begin by, yes. oh, okay. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Good morning, good afternoon, Chair Deitch and uh, esteemed members of the New York City Committee on Veterans. Uh, Chair Deitch, I, I just want to thank you uh, on behalf of our community of veterans here in New York City and on behalf of a grateful nation for your leadership standing up uh, in opposition to hatred of those 11 innocent Jewish congregants at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. Uh, our city is in mourning, our country, our world is in mourning. 
but I, I must just say as a point of personal heartfelt gratitude as a veteran to know that your leadership in this area didn't start this weekend, but in fact, you are the founder of your Flatbush Shomrim. You are the chair of the council uh, caucus, the Jewish caucus, and every single day um, you prove again and again why your work in those capacities as a prominent Jewish leader in our public life is such a compliment to your leadership capacity as the chair of the Committee on Veterans, so thank you. My name is Lori Sutton, and as always, I'm honored to serve as the founding commissioner of the New York City Department of Veterans Services. I'm joined today by Deputy Commissioner Jeff Roth and Eric Henry, Director of Intergovernmental Affairs. As Veterans Day approaches next month, including the myriad events occurring throughout the city of New York in November, DVS is excited to work together with our city partners to celebrate and honor the service of veterans, service members of all components, and family members locally and beyond. In particular, we invite everyone to participate in the annual New York City Veterans Day Parade, now known as America's Parade, organized by the United War Veteran Council on Sunday, November 11th, 2018. I look forward to seeing many of you on that special day as well as throughout the month. Today, I welcome the opportunity to discuss Local Law 23-2015, as well as the proposed intro 1118 for 2018. Before doing so, I would like to briefly highlight some of the ways DVS, since its transition from mayoral office to citywide department in 2016, has put forward tremendous effort into implementing best practices for connecting with New York City veterans, service members, and families, including active engagement and assistance activities to improve the lives of our community. D DVS is proud to continue its citywide presence with satellite sites in each of the five boroughs featuring posted office hours to participation in events occurring at a variety of venues throughout the city. Through the agency's newly organized engagement and community services unit, engagement coordinators are trained to connect veterans and their families to trusted resources throughout the city, including state and federal government resources, as well as, of course, our community-based organizations drawing from the private, philanthropic, and social sectors. In addition, DVS is committed to connecting veterans and their families to city careers, services, and resources through the DVS website for direct access to city job opportunities, collaborating with DCAS citywide recruitment and Workforce One centers, and all sectors to identify best practices and developing public-private partnerships aimed at enhancing business, educational, entrepreneurial, and employment opportunities. DVS also connects veterans and their families with opportunities to heal, to grow, and to thrive. As part of the First Lady of New York City's pioneering Thrive NYC Mental Health Initiative, DVS has developed the Vets Thrive NYC Core 4 Whole Health Model, which uses arts and education, peer-to-peer -peer support, holistic services, and clinical treatment to address the full impact war has on the mind, body, and spirit of our veterans and their loved ones. DVS continues to administer the provisions of Local Law 42, 2013, by providing trainings to city agency veteran liaisons, training such as Veteran Mental Health First Aid, which is also available to agencies, nonprofits, and veteran service organizations. Working in collaboration with our sister, our city agency, federal government, and community partners, DVS remains dedicated to effectively ending veteran homelessness in New York City. DVS's housing team continues to develop new housing resources and using our peer-to-peer -peer model, works directly with veterans in shelter to help navigate the housing search process in the city. 
This effort is supported by our in-house aftercare coordinator and constituent team that work day in and day out to prevent evictions and provide overall housing stability to formerly homeless and at-risk veterans. I'm delighted to share with you today that we have recently been approved to add another veteran peer coordinator to the team. This will increase the number of veterans we move into permanent housing by about 20%. Another important partnership is DVS's strong working relationship with the city's Veteran Advisory Board, the VAB, whose membership is currently in transition. We look forward to welcoming the upcoming round of mayoral and council appointments soon to be announced. Appointed by the mayor and speaker, the VAB membership is carefully chosen to sustain a diverse range of service backgrounds, community engagement interests, borough representation, and professional expertise to help facilitate dialogue within the New York City veterans community. Moving forward to the topics of today's hearing, I'm pleased to discuss Local Law 23, 2015, as well as the proposed intro 1118. 2018. Local Law 23 was introduced by Council Member Paul Vallone, passed by the City Council and subsequently signed by the Mayor in 2015. This law annually requires the Mayor's Office of Operations to compile various information regarding veterans utilizing housing assistance through the Department of Housing Preservation and Development and the New York City Housing Authority. Pl veterans applying for civil service through the Department of Citywide Administration Services and applying for and receiving licensing permits through the Department of Consumer Affairs and the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. This information is useful in evaluating how many veterans are accessing our city government through these specific agencies. And DVS appreciates the work performed by our sister agencies in documenting this data. In reviewing this data from the past three calendar years of 2014 through 17, positive trend lines are noteworthy in two specific areas. One, the number of veterans who have applied for employment with the City of New York through self-identification via their veterans civil service credit. And secondly, the number of veterans who have applied for and accessed our city's public housing stock. DVS is proud to work in collaboration with NYCHA, HPD, and HRA to connect veterans with eligible subsidies with all applicable <coughs> housing resources. We look forward to working with our fellow agencies involved to evaluate all data presented through the most recent report and determining how the City of New York can best continue to promote enhanced access to care, services, and resources for its veterans community. I would also like to mention that DVS has partnered with the Mayor's Office of Operations to provide an opportunity for veterans to self-identify through Local Law 127-2016, which requires city agencies such as the Department of Social Services, the Administration for Children's Services, the Department of, Homeland Serv of Homeless Services, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, the Department for the Aging, the Department of Youth and Community Development, and the Department of Education to provide to all persons served through these agencies with a demographic information survey that contains an option for multiracial ancestry or ethnic origin. This form is available now and we look forward to new insights we will learn concerning our city's veterans population. Regarding intro 1118, 2018, this proposal would require the Department of Veterans Services to submit an annual report to the Council on Agency Personnel Numbers, Titles, and Job Functions, the number of veterans who received services from DVS, the methods by which veterans and their families learned about seeking assistance through the agency, and the number of veterans engaged and assisted. Currently, city budget documents and the, the Mayor's Management Report include most of the information sought through Introduction 1118. Furthermore, these documents are released during the same time frame identified in this proposal. While DVS looks forward to continued collaboration with the City Council concerning DVS personnel and performance metrics, we are confident that these aims can best be achieved through existing reporting mechanisms. Thank you again for this opportunity to meet with you today. At this time, I'm happy to address any questions or ideas you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you for your partnership and work uh, with my office and uh, always being accessible um, when issues arise. 
Um, so um, let me let me just begin by um, so the applications for general vending licenses submitted by veterans uh, from 2014 2014 there were about 570 2015 there were four, 499 2016 427 and then 2017 372 so what is the reason like why they gradually um, go down like in 2014 it was uh, there were um, 570 mm -hmm. uh, vending licenses submitted by veterans and from 2014 to 2017 and currently in uh, 2017 you had 372 so I see the numbers are going down sure. so what do you think what is the reason for that you know we've we've consulted with our colleagues at DCA and in their estimation this is um, consistent with what they've seen across the city in terms of uh, decreased applications for uh, general as well as food vending licenses. We're not sure how much this applies to the veteran population. We do know that in 2013 there was legislation concerning uh, disabled veterans, which allows them uh, the opportunity to get special permits. We don't know if that may have taken some of the demand uh, up front before this legislation went into effect, but it's certainly something that we are open to uh, understanding more, and as you get feedback through your office and through the members of the uh, committee, we'd be very interested also in any uh, community and organizational feedback that anyone has. Uh, but so far, uh, we, we uh, know through DCA that uh, their thought is that perhaps uh, perhaps veterans like other uh, residents in the city may be pursuing you know, employment uh, opportunities elsewhere than the vending arena, but we don't know much more than that at this point. It's, it's really uh, at the level of, of uh, uh, consultation and raising the questions. Uh, is there any way or like who would, who would um, really like look into it to see mm -hmm. what the reason is? Is there anyone in the agency that is able to um, determine why, in fact, it went down? Is there anyone that? Yeah, our, our, uh, certainly our plan is to uh, continue our consultation with members of the community and various advocacy groups, including those who represent uh, veteran vendors, so we can get a better idea of what uh, may be going on within this particular uh, community. Okay, and that would be part of the report? You could add that into the report that, you know, if, if you see the reason why those numbers went down, like once you make your evaluation, if maybe we could bring that back. We're happy to talk to with see. you about anything yeah. that we find at any, at any time, certainly. Okay. But to, this, but to this point, that's what, we, uh, that's what we've been able yeah. to, to uncover. Okay, because I've also seen that um, not only the, 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 was the, uh, the vending licenses went down, but the vending licenses that were issued to veterans uh, as well went down. So if we could take a look at both, you know, why um, less people are applying, less veterans are applying for licenses, and those that um, have applied for those licenses haven't been receiving those licenses maybe. Absolutely. Because so, those numbers went down too. No, I, 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 would, uh, I would agree there's, there's uh, more to be learned from, from this data, and it's I would, you know, highlight and uh, Council Member Vallone over there. Thank you for your leadership uh, uh, in introducing this bill and, uh, you know, bring it to fruition three years ago. And I think it, it it sparks exactly these kinds of conversations, which can help us raise questions and better understand how the city can better provide uh, both access but also processes, which. Uh, make it easier for veterans and their uh, loved ones to, to seek, seek support. Great. Okay. I would also love to hear from the advocates if uh, you have any input that you would like to give um, uh, my office or uh, DVS on some of the reasons what you may think why uh, these numbers vary from, you know, going back three, four years up until, up until now. So that would be very helpful. Um, I see also on the civil service examination applications uh, received from uh, applicants claiming veterans uh, credits mm -hmm. that those numbers indeed, those numbers went up. Um, so in 2014, you had 3475, 
2015, uh, up until 2015, 1887, 2016, 2,843, and 2017, 5,094. So what would you attribute that to? Well, I think there are a number of factors here. Uh, we've been working very closely with our city uh, partners to get the word out uh, on city uh, civil service um, opportunities to be able to apply not just for the uniform services as important as those are but also for the myriad other career opportunities that exist within city government so my intention uh, certainly as we continue to mature and ripen and strengthen our uh, outreach uh, capabilities is that we would see that number continue to go up because the message we've been sending consistently <coughs> over the last several years is that uh, the city of New York, we're already the number one employer of veterans in New York City, but we wanna shine a, a brighter light on all of the opportunities, and I think these numbers indicating an upward trend uh, or pattern within the civil service um, examination application is very, very positive. Thank you. Um, I'm also, I'm looking at the use of HUD VASH vouchers administered mm -hmm. by NYCHA, mm -hmm. so I see that um, in all five boroughs, I see Bronx has the highest number of uh, HUD bash vouchers administrated by NYCHA. So I know like Queens, Brooklyn, you know, they have more veteran population uh, than the Bronx. So, and I see the Bronx has 1,200, uh, 1,222 um, on rental units. So uh, why, why would, why is it that the Bronx um, has that higher number opposed to other, other so, boroughs? So when it comes to, uh, for example, the HUD VASH vouchers, uh, the Bronx has had a real spike in terms of units and developments coming online. I think you've actually gone to visit at least one of those, much appreciated in terms of your hands-on leadership. Uh, I think that uh, you know, in any given year, it's going to vary depending upon where the housing stock is. We'd be glad to dig into it more uh, in more detail if you like. I know you're coming to visit us this Wednesday, and we look forward to that conversation. But certainly, wherever the the housing units are, we we get after them because we do not want a single unit left unfilled if a veteran can fill it. Okay, I know. Um, yeah, we have a meeting coming up because there were some issues with some of the. Um, some of the housing, particularly we had some vacancies. Um, I remember, you know, I know I met with some providers. Mm -hmm. They had about 28 vacancies. So now I know the number went down uh, working with DVS. And it disturbed me back then why there were so many vacancies when you have, um, when you have veterans who are looking for housing. So I want to thank uh, Jericho and, and other sure. providers on supportive housing. So, um, Mr. Chair, I'd, I'd like to thank you as well. I think your hands-on leadership uh, uh, exactly matches our aims and allowed us as a city to shine a brighter light on the complexities affecting the supportive housing market. Um, as a result, we have uh, moved forward to do several things. One is we've launched sort of an in-reach campaign to be able to socialize the benefits, the advantages of supportive housing within our homeless veteran population in the, the shelters. We've sought to mobilize the power of peer-to-peer -peer social support. We've also, um, our sister agency, HRA, has now um, launched a weekly report so that we've got weekly eyes on these units to make sure, as I said, that we don't let a single unit uh, go unfilled if a veteran can fill it. The other issue that I'd like to just bring to your attention is, you know, at the end of 2015, and this was an all of city, all of government, all of uh, uh, our service provider partners approach to achieving federal certification for effectively ending chronic veteran homelessness. And as you know, uh, the supportive housing eligibility criteria oftentimes includes chronicity. So we're actually engaged right now with our colleagues at HUD, and they are working with us right now to uh, finalize some guidance which we'll be presenting to the uh, continuum of care uh, 
group in November, and we'll certainly keep you posted because this is a great news story. If if we and other communities around the country that have effectively ended chronic veteran homelessness, if we can get a broadening of the eligibility cr criteria, yes. given that success, that would be that would be a wonderful thing. And it certainly looks like things are moving in that direction. Yes, it is. Point. Yeah. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, so. Um, Okay, so I just want to discuss that the agencies, and then we're going to get to the members, and I want to keep them waiting here all day. Um, in the areas the, that uh, veteran services, oh, um, the city agencies that offer veteran services like DCA, DCAS, uh, DOHMH, HPD, and HR. So, so either someone can walk into the agency and <clears throat> they could say they're a veteran, or, or they could walk into one of the DVS. Um, That's right. locations, yeah. So if someone walks into a city agency without going to DVS, mm -hmm. right, does how, what is that, what is the collaboration between the agency and DVS? Like if a veteran walks in um, to NYCHA um, mm -hmm. looking for housing, so does, do they notify DVS? Do you have a record of that? Or they do their own thing and you just wait for that veteran to come in uh, if they have an issue? Well, typically there's a uh, collaboration that goes both ways. If someone comes directly to DVS and there's something that NYCHA can help them with, then we help uh, uh, connect them and we keep track uh, in terms of what the outcome of that interaction is. Likewise, if someone goes to NYCHA, and, uh, our colleagues at NYCHA know that about our team and our program and we work together. So it's really a collaborative effort that can work both, both ways. So are, are, are these agencies like familiar with what resources a veteran um, may, may be eligible to, opposed to DVS getting involved mm -hmm. and saying, okay, you know something, there's more services or there's uh, quicker services that you're eligible to that the agency may not know of. Well, the good news is, is the agencies now know that we exist you know, just not too long ago, and uh, I know that uh, Council Member Mizell and uh, Ballone uh, remember this all too well, uh, but the good news is, is that we do exist. We also have an agency liaison at each of the agencies, and so the agencies themselves can uh, go directly to their own agency liaison. Sometimes they do that if it's uh, a fairly straightforward question or else they'll come straight to us, or the agency liaison does. But again, there's a lot of crosstalk, a lot of collaboration, and uh, you know we keep our agency li liaisons trained up. We've got quarterly check-in calls, and the communication ties just keep getting uh, stronger and stronger, particularly now that we have uh, agency status and have a lot more uh, capability to bring to the table. So the agency liaisons, um, they, do they work on the DVS, or they work on the... the they're uh, assigned to their respective agency, but they're officially um, appointed by their agency as a liaison for the Department of Veteran Services. So uh, we, you know, their department appoints them. They uh, belong to their agency, which is good because they, that way they can keep uh, abreast of all of the changes, all of the things affecting their particular agency. But then if we have a veteran who has an issue, uh, whose solution might be found through their agency, then we're able to directly contact the liaison and then we figure it out from there where we need to connect and, and to uh, find a solution for whatever the issue or problem may be. So do, do those liaisons report their, um, all, the case, all the case working, uh, all the cases they have to DVS or they may keep it within their agency? Let's say five veterans walked in this week um, do they keep that information or do, do they um, give it to DVS and say, oh, we just had five veterans who just walked in. I just wanted to let you know that this is what we're doing for them. You know, we don't have a formal reporting requirement from the agency liaisons to DVS, but we certainly do collaborate on many, many cases and, and it, it's a system that's worked well over time. But that's a good question that you raised and at, uh, at our next quarterly meeting, I think it would be important to, uh, uh, you know, to, to get a sense from them how many veterans they're, or how many questions they're fielding within their agencies that they're able to resolve right within their agencies. Yeah, this way we have a better idea of how many veterans, uh, we get the exact numbers um, of how many veterans are being served. So sure. I think that's, uh, that's important. Okay, before I continue, I'll, uh, just anyone have questions? Uh, we'll start with uh, Council Member Vallone. 
Good afternoon, Commissioner. Good afternoon. Staff, uh, God bless you and every veteran as Veterans Day is coming up. But as we always say, every day is Veterans Day, so always our blessings. And I think especially in the times that we're in after this weekend, um, there are those who reach out to you in times of need, and there are those who support you every day. I'm proud to be the latter. Yes, you are. Because you Thank cannot you. have one without the other. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, there's been a lot of work over the last few years. It's nice to see the data coming in. And I think Chair Deutsch's comments are exactly what we were looking for. So I guess it's the next step, and the Chair touched on that. What, what would you like to see now as the next step now that the stat is coming in? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, we are continuing to um, grow, mature, ripen, strengthen our uh, data systems internally. Two years ago, we didn't have a database. As a, an example, uh, when we were still under the mayor's office, uh, we were, um, uh, you know, not able to collate or systemically uh, report the data as we increasingly are today. A year ago in July was when we started our MMR collection, and we're very pleased to have our data for the first time. Oh, it's so uh, much important to, to look at those numbers now <laughs> versus just, <laughs> well, you know, coming up with uh, hypo hypo it's hypotheticals. True. It's, it's so much, not, not easy is not the right word, but it's a starting point. It's a starting point. And I think know, the chair's question about delineating between the veterans that came through you and the veterans that came through the other agencies, I think that's, that's kind of critical. So I think we should make, before somebody submits a bill or anything, I think we should, we should make that a requirement, and I think that would be a perfect tool for you to see where those new requests for services are coming from, how many are coming through the department, how many are mm -hmm. coming through sister agencies. Um, I would like to see that. I would like to see, and then I guess on a follow-up to the creation of the information, the liaisons were kind of, not so much voluntarily, but they were created internally. Are, are you comfortable with that program as it stands, that having someone in every mayoral agency reporting to you at this point? You know, that's worked, that's worked very well. Uh, we, we maintain contact with them. We conduct regular training. They know that they can uh, reach out to us whenever they need, need help. We've really built a relationship of trust throughout city government. I will say that And it's at every agency now? Pardon me? Is there a liaison in every agency? There is a liaison in every agency. And, you know, uh, when, uh, when there's a transition, one agent one agency liaison perhaps moves on to another one, then we work with the agency so that they'll identify a replacement. But we've gotten very good support. And I would say that uh, one thing to just uh, recognize is that, uh, you know, some veterans uh, don't self-report, and that's something that we're working on to help our sister agencies and to help actually around the city folks understand that you know, one of the things we've learned over the last several years is if you want to get a really inadequate and in incomplete uh, number of veterans that you're serving, ask that question, are you a veteran? Because you'll get answers all over the map. Uh, we find that the two questions that really are most effective, one is, have you ever served in the United States Armed Forces, National Guard, or Reserves? The second one, has your spouse or any family member living in your household ever served in the United States Armed Forces, National Guard, or Reserves? It gives you a far more complete uh, n um, number because, one, you count in the peacetime veterans. Uh, some people, you know, uh, think, you know, well, women veterans were a particular culprit. Uh, we don't like to self-report, and we think, well, if we haven't been in a combat role or – you know, there are all number of reasons that folks are reticent to uh, self-identify, but I, I think that's also an area where, under the leadership of the mayor and the council and, and all of New York City's uh, veterans community and advocates, just the standing up of this agency gives our veterans, our community, the clear message that they are valued, that we consider them as civic assets, and that we are committed to supporting and empowering their continued ability to serve on behalf of others. So then that they have this, this greater tool to self-identify, what would you say is one of the remaining larger obstacles for our veteran community in accessing these city services? 
you know, it's always a challenge, uh, a challenge we eagerly embrace, but it's always a challenge to just keep getting the information out there. And so, for example, let me just uh, share with you um, That's you know, come up in the past, the yeah, co coordination of information between Absolutely. So one thing that we've, we've just left a few, I think about 25 or so uh, of our one-pagers here that mm -hmm. really, uh, at a glance, as well as the RF code that gives folks just direct access through their devices to our, uh, our website, uh, that gives folks really an overview of everything that we do, knowing that uh, if we can get their attention through our outreach efforts, then we have an opportunity to further engage with one-on-one -on -one dialogue to better understand their concerns, and then that leads to the assistance where we're absolutely actually able to connect veterans and their loved ones to city services, care, or resources. So Which I think is important when we go to the outer boroughs, too. Right, oh. so as, as a Queens council, we're always fighting to make sure the services are spread out throughout the boroughs because sometimes it's difficult Absolutely. to get them to get that information and get veterans too. And that was part of the reason of creating Queens uh, has 28 percent of our ve veteran <laughs> right. population. Uh, and my last chair uh, question, chair, Mr. Chair, is you know, there's been talk about expanding vendor licenses, mm -hmm. and some of that talk is not for vendors. So I, I was opposing, but I'd like to have some support. From, from you and on that, that we have to be careful if we're going to touch the system of vendor licensing in the city that's going to somehow water down or remove the privilege that veterans have received for that. And I didn't see clarity in that last bill regarding that, and that's why they didn't get my support on it. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of work has to be done on that, but I think we have to be vigilant in any attempt to remove the benefits that veterans have for some cause of some other cause. And I think there's a reason why we have that benefit. I don't necessarily want to see that removed. So and we would certainly it. look forward to continuing our engagement and dialogue with central staff as that uh, comes back uh, into consideration. Absolutely. We've been a voice for veteran vendors. We'll continue to be a voice. So we look forward to teaming with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Anybody else? Alan? No? OK. Um, so uh, my next question is, is that if uh, a veteran uh, goes to one of the mayoral agencies and gets rejected, let's say, um, for Michelama apartment, do they, do they report to you, back to you, to DVS, or they just tell them that they're rejected for whatever reason? Um, like, does it get back to DVS? Like, if, if, if their veteran's liaison rejects an application, um, do, do they report to DVS? You know, I'll have to check on that. I'm not sure. I'm not aware of a formal reporting mechanism, but let me check on that. Let's talk about that on Wednesday. Okay. Um, okay, finally, um, first of all, I just want to say that we, um, I want to thank you. We're going to be having the roundtable on all those uh, veteran organizations who provide many resources to the veterans. Uh, just to let everyone know, we're going to be having a roundtable um, uh, discussion and each agency will be sending in like a uh, one-page description of what resources they offer to veterans and then we're going to make a pamphlet out of out of that uh, with all the agencies and we're going to see what loopholes uh, there are that we need we still need to to fund in the future but this way we're all on the same page and everyone's going to have that resource book so this way, you don't have to go on a website and navigate sometimes. It may be a little difficult, so people could just, um, will have that handy resource book and just see like when they need legal services or housing. Um, this will be a, a great tool for our veteran population. This is something new. And uh, we look forward to yeah. working with you on that, Mr. Chair. And uh, in addition to that, um, I also have uh, invite you, we have a meeting with DOE on adding the two questions on the student application. Looks like they may be coming uh, towards um, uh, the request that I made of having those two questions on the student applications. Are you a child of a veteran or a, uh, a child of, a, uh, of someone on a parent who's an active military? So this way we know that when it comes to the GI Bill, we know what resources we could give out uh, to the children, what resources we could give to a parent um, who is a veteran 
or someone in active military duty. So we definitely look forward to working on that as well with you, Mr. Chair. Also, when you mentioned the GI Bill, um, just want to mention that there's uh, we brought again about 25, I think, or so copies of the uh, joint memo that the Department of Social Services and DVS collaborated on. It was sent out to our uh, about 80 campuses, their veteran uh, certifying officials and veteran coordinators. Uh, and I know that you're participating on the press le release that'll go out later today uh, that really uh, frames the way in which the city of New York is standing up to support its veterans and to make sure that anyone who might be at risk of being evicted, evicted because of the delay in receiving the basic housing allowance, as an example, uh, that the city's got a solution. We stand up behind our veterans and their families. So thank you so much and please everyone who's here please put the word out. We have a lot of student veterans right now who are very, very worried that the city has a solution that'll keep them out of uh, uh, financial jeopardy. Great, thank you so much. Um, so, do you support this bill? As I said, Mr. Chair, I uh, am eager to talk with you in further detail about this bill, but uh, it, it, to my uh, read, uh, much of what's covered in the introduction is already uh, published and available in city documents. Um, so I, my, my view is that between our regular dialogue and our engagements, as well as the public documents, including now uh, the MMR, which as we've talked about is the first, uh, the first year that we've been able to be part of the MMR, I feel like the existing mechanisms are, are sufficient. Okay, I think that um, uh, this uh, this bill is a, um, a step forward to receiving the information that we, we need and we deserve and the veterans deserve. Uh, and this way we could better continue to understand uh, what the issues are and how we could uh, better implement um, some of the, in the areas that we need improvement. So this is, it's basically, it's a reporting bill and I think it's important for the city council um, to receive uh, this information. Uh, this way we could uh, better understand. And we'll continue to engage in, in dialogue and certainly discussions with the central staff on this uh, as we go forward, but certainly we share the aims and the intention and the motivation behind this bill, and so uh, we'll look forward to uh, further engagement and dialogue as we, as we go forward. But I, 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 would, I would say that uh, as a commissioner who just, you know, two years ago, if I had had two members of my, my team sitting beside me, that would have been 60% of the office. And uh, I think we've come such a long way uh, that it's exciting now to be able to, as we start out in year number three, to be able to even contemplate things such as we're talking about in this introduction and others, uh, the, the bills that are aging. So thank you so much for your leadership and your support and we'll continue We'll keep on marching, Mr. Chair. Um, okay, so finally, um, okay, so we'll have a conversation uh, about this, and I think this is crucial. I'm going to keep on pushing to make sure that we get the information we need from the people working in DVS, um, and uh, in order to further work together uh, with the advocates and with DVS. Uh, to make sure that we have all information we need. Um, and uh, so I look forward to that. So I want to thank you, staff, uh, for their close uh, collaboration and partnership. I know that we're working in the, in the area. Uh, I think we're setting up a meeting now um, regarding the support of housing and housing with your agency um, to, to see if we could um, open up um, more rentals and apartments for veterans and uh, so this way we could we could get more people off the street and out of shelters so thank you very much and we're going to hear from the advocates if you could if you don't mind if you have are you sticking around or I'll, there's no more important place for me to be great Mr. thank Chair. you very much thank Commissioner. you very much thank you Uh, okay.
Okay, Coco Colhane, uh, Ashton Stewart, and Christine Rouse. Who are you, Christine? Oh, there you are. Christine, why are you hiding in the back? We'll start with you, Coco. Um, this is where you went. Good afternoon, Committee on Veterans. My name is Coco Colhane, and I'm the director of the Veteran Advocacy Project. We provide free legal services um, to low-income veterans and their families with a focus with those who are living with post-traumatic stress, traumatic brain injury, and substance use disorders. The creation of the Department of Veteran Services was a su success celebrated by everyone. Um, The test is good. Test that wasn't part test of your like. <laughs> that wasn't part of your speech, right? Yeah. Trying to keep things exciting. Um, a couple of years later, the department has had a chance to explore its role in the city and settle in, and I think the community has had a chance to size them up in return. Um, some advocates are wondering about what the agency should be doing, and there's been talk of benefits, appeals, behavioral health, and other services. But I think that it may be that DBS faces a similar dilemma as the VA a public perception that the agency is supposed to take care of all of veterans' needs. Um, and a look at the New York City Charter reveals, in fact, that the mandate of the Department of Veterans Services is to inform. So, um, you know, given that the department was formed to act as a hub, they've gone above and beyond. We all know about their collaboration in terms of ending homelessness. It's a nationally lauded um, model, which has just been fantastic. Um, and I think that, that the community sees that concrete work and rightfully asks what's next, which is not to say that homelessness is, is <laughs> solved, obviously. Um, but I think that asking what's next has to be done within a framework of efficiency and a framework that aligns with the agency's mandate. And so before talking about expanding into more direct services, let's ensure that the agency is actually fulfilling its mission as it was set up. Um, which is to form, to inform and connect veterans and their families to resources. So VAP, uh, Veteran Advocacy, supports the introduction of Local Law 1118 and believes that DVS reporting on even more figures than they already do will benefit the entire community. Um, you know, the resources in New York City are endless and a simple search can be very overwhelming. And, uh, you know, New York, NY, or NY serves NYC, soon to be Vet Connect. Um, is hard at work behind the scenes, I think, you know, working out eligibility and all of those details, but DVS really needs to be the center of communication and where any uh, veteran, service member, family member can reach out and get all the information that they need and be sent to all of those resources. Um, so for that reason, we would encourage the council to define the word services in the bill, in the law. Um, requiring more detail on services will reveal meaningful information about the achievements of DVS and may even highlight further needs in the city. Uh, you know, my organization could say we engaged a thousand veterans this year, but without knowing what engaged means, you have no idea what was accomplished. Um, outcomes are what matter, and this law asks for the number of services, right, the number of veterans served, and then the method of how the veterans found the department. So. Finding out that method is not really meaningful. So if you have a report where it says, you know, an outreach specialist met a veteran at an event, you've got a number one and you've got method event, and that's all you really know. Um, so we should be asking what kind of informing is happening and is it happening effectively? And, um, you know, number served just doesn't shed light on what was achieved. So tying the language of subsection A 
to the substantive requirements that are in the charter, uh, you know, those topical areas uh, where service members are supposed to be able to come to DVS and learn about, right, like the employment resources, education benefits, all of that. You know, tying that definition will provide the community with better data on what's being accomplished by the department. Um, and requesting that is also going to give all of us insight, right? We'll be able to recognize trends. We may be able to see the gaps in services that uh, the chairman was referring to. Um, it's really something that I think can provide not only accountability, but um, insight and guidance. And in conclusion, you know, veterans were held accountable each day of their service in a way that many civilians will never experience, and we owe it to them to hold our agencies and ourselves to the same level of accountability. So uh, I look forward to seeing how DVS develops, and let's make sure we have the meaningful data to track its impact. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chairman Deutsch and the committee for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Kristen Rouse. I'm an Army veteran with more than 24 years in service, including three tours of duty in Afghanistan. I'm president and founding director of the New York City Veterans Alliance, a member-driven grassroots policy, advocacy, and community building or organization that advances veterans and families as civic leaders. And just to note, a key, uh, a key project that we run is our veterans.nyc, which provides real-time uh, information on community events that are happening around the city for veterans and their families. Uh, it's the only regional community calendar of its kind, uh, and we're growing in, uh, in, in online visits. Again, it, it reaches those who are able to access information online. Uh, but And we can see uh, through the city servers that uh, the city is making great use of our calendar and, uh, and we appreciate um, DVS's uh, support uh, of our veterans and, uh, and we, continue, we look forward to continuing uh, that relationship. Um, on behalf of our members and supporters, we state our strong support for this committee providing oversight of the services provided to veterans and their families by DVS and other city agencies, programs, and funding. We are, however, uncertain of whether intro 1118 or other recent bill proposals will effectively accomplish the oversight and accountability that our community has called for and deserves. In February 2015, I stood beside members of this committee, including council members Ballone and Eugene, in a city hall press conference to laud the passage of Local Law 23 of 2015, uh, which we've talked about already today. Um, we're glad to hear that that data has become available uh, and is now being utilized by DVS to assess the overall, uh, the overall provision of services, uh, the accessibility of services to veterans and their families. Um, we did, did not see prior to this hearing uh, that that was made public. Has that, has that information been made public? I have not. Okay, so, uh, so my, the, the te my testimony refers to uh, not having that information at this time. Um, later in 2015, we advocated for the creation of an independent city agency overseeing veteran services, stating the need that our community saw for this new agency to play a vital coordinating role in how the city delivers and accounts for services to veterans and their families at taxpayer expense. The establishment and growth of DVS has been a tremendous benefit to our veterans community, but an agency limited in size must be empowered in its scope to synchronize and manage the city's efforts to reach, serve, and be accountable to veterans and their families. The intent behind bills heard today and last June to bring accountability for DVS in, ve in the veterans and family members it is serving is good, but even better would be for this committee to examine ways it can further empower DVS to accomplish its mission. To this end, we pose the following questions to this committee. Number one, will you make public the reports from Local Law 23 uh, 2015 that we've discussed today. Um, will, it, will this reporting be made visible in the Mayor's Management re Report uh, and or other essential city re citywide reporting? Number two, will new legislation ensure that the city's contracting and management of Vet Connect NYC will effectively track services, referrals, and referral methods follow-up metrics, and other key access and accountability data for veterans and family members seeking resources from DVS and other government and community-based organizations. Number three, 
will legislation include provision for a dedicated agency chief contracting officer, otherwise known as an ACO, to manage the city's contracts for veteran services, to include not only Vet Connect NYC, but also the $2.3 million in discretionary funds granted uh, by the city to community-based organizations for the purpose of serving veterans and their families. Number four, will new legislation ensure that DVS would not need to duplicate reporting already included in the MMR, budget documents, and other existing public information and open data on its activities, staff, and salaries? And number five, also related to prior legislation, uh, is this committee still overseeing the Veterans Advisory Board? Um, as the city's only chartered body of veterans advising city government, the VAB currently has 11 members serving on terms that expired last year and early this year. The VAB did not meet its mandated five meetings last year, and it has held three public meetings without quorum or cu current appointments. There's much work ahead for DVS as it continues building programs and growing in its performance and accountability to the veterans and family members it serves. There are, there's also much, much work ahead for the Veterans Committee. On behalf of the New York City Veterans Alliance, I thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Pending your questions, this concludes my testimony. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, and those are very important questions. Uh, the VAB, we're almost uh, about to complete. Um, uh, we had to uh, submit to the mayor's office and to the speaker's office, and they had to vet each, uh, each board member. So it's uh, we're almost uh, basically done on that. So it's been, it's yeah. been a while. It's been a, yes, it's been a while. Um, and uh, it expired uh, most recently is when I uh, took over the Veterans Committee. And um, they, have to, they have to go through the process. Mm -hmm. And I've been meeting with um, people on the boards. And it's uh, basically almost done. So thank you very much. And the other questions, very important questions, we'll have the committee um, get back to you thank on those you. questions. So thank you very much. Thank you for holding this Veterans Committee hearing. My name is Ashton Stewart, and I am the coordinator of the SAGE Vets program at SAGE. SAGE is the country's first and largest organization dedicated to improving the lives of LGBT older adults. Founded in New York City in 1978, SAGE has provided comprehensive social services and programs to LGBT older people for nearly four decades. SAGE Vets is one of our program offerings and is the only program in all of New York City designed for older, older LGBT adults. And in fact, SAGE Vets is a statewide program engaging older LGBT veterans across New York State. New York State and New York City are among the top 10 states and cities with the highest concentrations of gay and lesbian veterans, both in number and per capita, and the needs are deep among LGBT older veterans. According to a recent statewide survey by the LGBT Health and Human Services Network, 56% of LGBT veterans were over the age of 50. Many LGBT older veterans in New York State are struggling and yet are not accessing the services they need. Also according to the New York State LGBT Health and Human Services Network, 43% of lesbian, gay, and bisexual vets live or are under 200% of the fe federal poverty line. And that number is even higher for transgender veterans with 60% earning less than $31,000 per year. 30% of lesbian, gay, and bisexual veterans were homeless, and 46% of transgender veterans were homeless. 34% of lesbian, gay, and bisexual veterans were food insecure, with over 61% of transgender veterans st struggling with food insecurity. 30% of lesbian, gay, and bisexual veterans, and 48% of transgender vets fear discrimination from their providers. Staggeringly, one-third of our state's LGBT, LGBT veterans who answered the survey identified as transgender. This mirrors national data, and across the country, 163,000 veterans identify as transgender, and of the 163,000, more than 51,000 are 65 and older. In other words, 31.8% of transgender veterans are over the age of 65. In fact, the Veterans Health Administration indicates the prevalence of diagnosed gender dysphoria among former U.S. service members is five times that of prevalence estimates in the general population. Psychiatry.org defines gender dysphoria as someone who is uncomfortable with their body or with the expected roles of their assigned gender. According to a 2016 article in The Gerontologist, due to the rapidly increasing aging population and the high proportion of veterans among older Americans, the number of transgender older adults with a history of military service will continue to increase substantially. And with respect to employment, 
Our state's transgender and LGB veterans are having a hard time finding and keeping a job. 46% of transgender veterans report being unfairly fired, that's nearly half. Similarly, 28% of lesbian, gay, and bisexual veterans report the same. 47.5% of transgender veterans report being unfairly not hired. Among lesbian, gay, and bisexual veterans, that number is over one-third at 34.8%. LGBT older people struggle more with financial insecurity in their later years. Out and Visible, Sage's market study on the attitudes of LGBT people ages 45 to 75 found that more LGBT older people are worried that they haven't saved enough money to retire. In fact, 42% of LGBT older people are very or extremely concerned that they will outlive the money they have saved for retirement, as compared to 25% of non-LGBT older people. 44% of LGBT older people are very or extremely concerned that they will not have to, or that they will have to work well beyond retirement age just to have enough money to live, as compared to 26% of non-LGBT older people. And transgender older people experience even more extreme levels of financial insecurity, especially when you consider the high levels of unemployment and underemployment throughout their adult lives. Consider that older uh, LGBT veterans served in the military at a time when discrimination against LGBT veterans and people was rampant and a matter of official government policy. Add that to the current administration that is trying to ban transgender people from serving in the military and the financial insecurity and unemployment and underemployment it's no wonder why our LGBT veterans are struggling and not accessing their federal VA and related benefits. Instead, many rely on state public assistance programs, shifting what should be a federal expense to New York State. SAGE created SAGE Vets with support from New the New York State Assembly to respond to the swelling need among LGBT vets and to improve access to care among LGBT older veterans across the state. Veterans are former federal employees who have earned the right to access veteran programs and services that are designed to improve their overall health and well-being. Sage Vet saves both the state and the city significant amounts of money by ensuring veterans access the federal benefits entitled to them. Council members, thank you for your continued support of Sage. We at Sage look forward to partnering with the New York City Council to ensure that our LGBT veterans can receive the support that they so richly deserve after proudly serving our country with pride. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, you did say here that um, the LGBT veterans are struggling and not accessing the federal VA related benefits. How many, um, how many of those do you feel that you serve um, each year? That's a great question. We just started doing a report um, for the New York State Assembly. Um, I took over the program in May and for the last two quarters, we're about at uh, 400 veterans that we've had dialogue with, we made presentations to, we've presented the program to them. We go all over the state, we've been to Rochester, we've been to the State Fair in Syracuse over the summer. Um, Long Island, um, we go out there often. We're starting to develop our relationships with other VSOs to reach out to the over 100,000 LGBT veterans that are in the state. Um, I'm helping a veteran right now with a discharge upgrade case. Um, I'm working with another one who I'm trying to encourage him to do the same. He's never uh, been a, enrolled in the VA um, because of his experience in the military. Um, the self-identification that was discussed earlier is a bigger problem among the LGBT veteran community because a lot of them were serving during Vietnam, so you have the combat issues. PTSD, more than likely, I'm working with a client getting assessed for that. Um, and then you also have the discrimination and the homophobia that was part of their experience. Um, this is prior to Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Um, so the numbers are great. I, I'm working closely uh, doing client care. Um, so 400 was the approximate number for the last two quarters, and uh, there's a lot more work to be done. Is that statewide? or That's, that's statewide, uh, given uh, there was about 66 that we have from our Rochester affiliate. Sage up and, and Sage Upstate um, has a few as well, and also Sage has um, centers in Brooklyn, Harlem, Staten Island, and uh, yeah. If you can give me the numbers for New York City, New York uh, City, yeah. Um, this off the top of my head, we have uh, 400 in the database for for, and that's minus the 66. So, so it's about 350. Just so in New York so City. the all 350, um, all these individuals have the information of, um, of 
you know, the veterans um, services. Yes, and we're well. also trying to do a database as well um, that's a little bit broader in scope because we're a statewide program, but we're also trying to categorize uh, city services opposed to statewide and also some of the, the more specific veteran programs for LGBT veterans. We're gonna have a se separate category right. for that, and that's all part of our, our, um, our uh, deliverables for the funding. Mm -hmm. All right, um, thank you all for taking the time uh, to uh, testify today. Um, look forward to working with all of you. And I hope next time Christine comes here, she'll sit right in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'd like to call up, um, I think two more? Two. Okay. Uh, the last two people who are testifying of Adam. I'm not sure you'll, I can't read your last name. Oh, so, oh. Uh, and uh, to what? Hello. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I want to begin by thanking uh, Commissioner Sutton for her leadership um, with DVS. Um, Chairman Deutsch and distinguished members of the committee, um, on behalf of Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America and our uh, more than 425,000 members, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to testify here today um, on the pending legislation. Uh, my name is Vadim Panasuk. Um, I'm a New Yorker, a Ukrainian expatriate. Uh, naturalized citizen, um, an Iraq war veteran serving two uh, tours with the 3rd Infantry Division, um, and a master's level uh, social worker uh, working as a senior veteran transition manager, um, VTM, uh, uh, VA benefits lead with AVA's Rapid Response Referral Program, or RIP uh, for short. RIP is AVA's high tech, high touch uh, referral uh, service for veterans and their families with a complete and comprehensive case management component. Uh, we assist veterans of all eras uh, with any discharge status uh, worldwide in confronting significant challenges like unemployment, uh, financial or legal struggles, uh, homelessness, and mental health related issues. Uh, to date, RIP has served almost 9,000 veterans uh, and family members nationwide and over 1,000 in New York City alone, uh, providing critical support and resources to ensure that uh, the city's veterans' needs are effectively met. After 14 years, IAVA has become a, the preferred empowerment organization uh, for post-9-11 veterans. While our members are spread throughout the nation, we are proud uh, to say that our national headquarters is located in New York City. Um, since its beginning, IAVA has fought for and has been successful in advocating for policies that are able to meet the needs of our newest generation of veterans, which includes our advocacy towards the creation, proper funding, and oversight of Department of Veteran Services, DVS. DVS has enormal, uh, enormous potential, and its establishment nearly two years ago was a historic moment for uh, veterans of the city. Uh, DVS can significantly streamline access and improve service delivery to many of the most critical veteran-specific programs and resources uh, already available here. Um, today, we voice our concern uh, to the veteran co uh, Veterans Committee uh, that the additional reporting requirement for the department um, in the, their current form do not do enough to uh, measure effectiveness and to ensure proper oversight of DVS and its programs to include uh, VetConnect NYC. IVA supports the intent behind the bill. Uh, however, it appears that it is somewhat redundant as some of the data is already widely available um, and does not require the reporting of necessary metrics to accurately evaluate the department's performance in many of its various initiatives. IVA is a data-driven organization, and as such, our view is that when uh, appropriate metrics are applied for measuring the program performance and uh, veteran outcomes, services delivered can continue to improve and become more accessible and effective uh, for the target population. This, all, uh, this approach also empowers us to identify positive and negative trends and to better uh, document accomplishments to be studied and replicated elsewhere. Uh, this bill does not require the reporting of orga organizational and programmatic metrics necessary to accurately assess DVS's performance or its many, uh, or its impact on the on the city's veterans. 
IAVA has applied uh, metrics as a service standard uh, to various components of our, uh, of our RIP team. RIP is staffed by a dedicated team of master level uh, veteran transition managers. For example, our clients receive a survey every time we make a referral. The client is uh, able to provide feedback and rank the quality, timeliness, effectiveness, and customer service of every organization we refer to. We also provide the same opportunity to the client to grade RIP, as well as the VTM uh, they were working with once the case is closed, providing us with a gauge of our own performance. Using qualitative data in tandem with quantitative metrics has helped us better understand the, uh, the needs uh, of the population we serve and to continue to make targeted improvements to services we provide. Um, as a senior, vet, uh, senior VTM, I've also had the pleasure uh, to work with many of Vet, Con uh, Vet Connect NYC, um, and we have found them to be very responsive and easy to work with, but we have had challenges in seamlessly receiving referrals. Uh, one of the challenges is a burdensome increase in the uh, amount of digital paperwork needed to sync the work of our case management team with Vet Connect NYC. Another clear deficit we see uh, we can see is the lack of comprehensive case management component. We also view the requirement to use the VetConnect software to participate in the network as a barrier limiting the number of types, the number and types of programs available th uh, through VetConnect NYC. As, Vet, uh, as VetConnect NYC continues to find foot its footing as a platform, we encourage this committee to provide them with the oversight and tools needed to be successful. Uh, members of the committee, thank you again for the opportunity to share IVA's views on these issues today and look forward to answering um, any questions you may have. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, do you work with DVS on a daily basis, a weekly basis? Um, we receive uh, their referrals whenever uh, they want to send veterans our way. Sometimes it's daily, sometimes it's weekly, um, so yes. And if you have a, if you have a uh, problem navigating through Vet Connect. I mean, you know you could feel free always to contact DVS and they could even help you with that with those the paperwork. Oh, so, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, so that's that's what they're there for. And also uh, this bill um, is just a um, a start um, of the reporting. We need to start from somewhere. Uh, we cannot go down and just like ask for every single report um, you know right away. So this we're doing this is this is a starting point. And as we receive more information from advocates and see what the issues, what's, what more issues we still need to address when it comes to reporting. So this is a start of it. Um, so I want to thank you for taking the time. Um, I know it's not easy uh, to take some time off and to, to sit here for a few minute testimony. And it's, it's really um, it's recognized and appreciated. So thank you. Um, Tawaki, it's great to see you again. As always, we'll see if it's great to see you today, <laughs> what it usually is. Go um, ahead. So to begin my testimony, um, let me play an audio recording that I legally and se secretly recorded where I reside last week um, in terms of deficiencies with repairs, lack of oversight. Um, so there's a lot of talk that goes on in this room, but after okay, can you just explain? Um, sure, I'll put in the context. 
Um, the person who you heard in that audio recording was me and someone who works in that building. Which building? Um, at 802 Fairmount Place in the Bronx. You and I have had conversations previously about... I, I, I want people to hear, so is that yeah, a... Uh, it's uh, an HRA building. HRA, I have HRA's contract with Urban Pathways that confirms it can fire Urban Pathways for, for negligence at any point in time. I've repeatedly put um, HRA... Is that, is that a NYCHA building? HRA. HRA, okay. I got assaulted in that building. I got 15 punches to my head on July 2nd, 2016. I got a concussion from that assault. That concussion cost me a job that would have paid me $450 a day. And HRA is also doing business with a company that stole my pay si like six years ago. Um, it's a company called NTT Data, an IT company. Um, the chief operating officer committed perjury in a sworn affidavit. So like I said, there's a lot of talk that goes on in this room, but there's hardly any action thereafter. So when I leave this room, I'm going to be walking over to federal court to file papers for an, an emergency injunction to essentially force HRA to uh, fire Urban Pathways to cancel its contract with Urban Pathways, to cancel its contract with NTT Data, so that people like you don't have to keep financing it, since all contracts with government agencies are financed by taxpayers. Um, also, there's going to be a meeting scheduled this Thursday between Urban Pathways and people who live in my building at HRA's office at 33 Beaver Street. I found out about that today. However, in the papers I'm going to file with federal court, that's going to put an end to that because I wasn't notified of that meeting. There was also a public hearing in September about legal assistance, that kind of stuff. When I tried going to HRA's office to take a look at the draft, co the draft, draft contracts prior to that meeting, they didn't let me inside. So you're talking, you're having this meeting today about how veterans can get access to services provided by um, city agencies. So if I can't walk through the door of HRA at 150 Greenwich to see what's in those contracts to object to it prior to that meeting, how does that befit the purpose that you're having this meeting for today? Um, also, um, there's going to be a court hearing in three days at the Bronx Criminal Court. Um, that's in relation to me. Twelve days after I testified against the NYPD on December 14th of last year in City Hall, uh, members of the NYPD illegally stopped, harassed, assaulted, and injured me um, when I engaged in self-defense lawfully. They arrested me for that. I got an IAB letter right over here saying, we substantiated your claims against the officers. When I talked to Ms. Uh, Darcel Clark, the Bronx DA, about th this letter, she told me uh, she can't talk to me about it. And in this particular case, I don't have any evidence, despite the fact this dates back to December of last year. The officers were wearing body cameras. The court-appointed counsels that were assigned to me didn't do their job, so I had to fire them. So the point is, you're again, you're talking about services for veterans. So if I was lawfully engaged in self-defense against these people that grabbed my arm while I was walking on the sidewalk for no reason, and I w have to walk into court despite having this IAP notice in my hand, then where exactly are the services being provided to veterans? That's in my testimony. Thank you. Um, when was that recording made? Um, October 25th. Of? This year. This year. I have more recordings in the video in case. And, and what exactly was on that recording? Besides, I mean, can you just explain? Yeah. Um, so what basically, I was looking to supplement existing proof I already had against Urban Pathways. So they've been pocketing the cash that taxpayers have been providing to them through HRA. They haven't been making repairs. They've had the building invalidly registered with HPD. I had conversations with Mr. Banks, Stephen Banks, face-to-face -face with Ms. Stringer, the head of HPD, face-to-face. -face. They told me they would look into it. Things would improve. So this lady was complaining about rats. This was a guy who was – this was a guy who works for Urban Pathways who – Put me, uh, apprised me of the fact. Whose apartment was that? Um, he was. We were talking in the hallway. Oh, but it wasn't a. It wasn't he, inside he, someone's. No, apartment. he was talking. Oh. There are deficiencies in specific apartments as well. I recorded black mold in one person's apartment. There's a disabled guy. No, but no, yeah, but who who reported the mold? You did. Yeah, or? I went in their apartment too. Yeah, but how come that person doesn't report it? They're lackadaisical. So I'm sorry. They're lack. They're not proactive in that regard. Yeah, but. Yeah, but they also the they also reported it to um, Urban Pathways and nothing got happen nothing happened. So instead of reporting the violation to HPD, they reported it directly to the property manager. The property manager paid a deaf a blind ear or whatever uh, to the problem, and let the problem persist. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Tamaki, thank you for coming down today, um, testify, and I think we are done for today, and today's uh, hearing is adjourned.